Hello, my name is Terry Anderson, and I'm a board member at the North American Unitarian Association. I'm really pleased that you've uh, dropped in to uh, watch this recording. It's um, of the first uh, class by the NAUA Academy, and it uh, the, the talk that you're going to hear uh, by uh, Bruce Knotts is just the first part of a, a session that included questions and answers and, and breakout rooms. Uh, we hope you enjoy this recording and uh, would uh, welcome and invite you to uh, come to uh, additional uh, NAUA Academy courses uh, in real time on Zoom <clears throat> or to watch these recordings. Um, our speaker today is, uh, is uh, Bruce Knotts. Uh, the topic is the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. And it focuses on Unitarian Universalism at the United Nations. Uh, Bruce uh, was the director of the Unitarian Universalist Office at the United Nations until 2022. He got his bachelor's degree in history from Pepperdine University and his master's degree from Monterey. Uh, Bruce was a Peace Corps volunteer in Ethiopia. He worked for Retham in Saudi Arabia and on a World Bank contract in Somalia. He joined the Department of State as a diplomat in 1984, and in 2004 was elected to the Board of Gays and Lesbians and Foreign Affairs Agencies. Bruce retired from the Foreign Service in 2007 and joined the, Universe, the Unitarian Universalist Office at the United Nations at ex Executive Director. In so without further ado, uh, let me introduce to you or uh, turn the mic over to uh, Bruce Knotts. Thanks for the great introduction and thank you all for being here. So the topic of this uh, session today is to talk about the 60 year history of the Unitarian Universalist Office at the United Nations. And we had a wonderful 50th anniversary in 2012 uh, we had our event actually at the New York Times Center here in New York, and uh, we had Adlai Stevenson Jr., the son of Governor Adlai Stevenson, Gillian Sorensen, who was the mm -hmm. wife of uh, John F. Kennedy's uh, speechwriter, Ted Sorensen. We also had a granddaughter of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, so it was quite an event. And we also commissioned a film and you're going to see that film in a minute here. And the film, it was done by a professional photographer who uh, donated his time uh, and, and did the uh, f uh, f photography. And the voiceover is done by Andre Brower. And you probably don't know the name, but you have seen this person. He is a well-known African-American actor. He was in Glory. He was in Primal Fear, City of Angels, Salt, just a whole lot of movies and TV shows. His wife, um, Amy Bradson, is, has been on uh, tel a lot of television shows. They've got two wonderful kids. They are UUs. They are mem members of the Montclair Unitarian Universalist Congregation. And uh, Andre actually did the voiceover from his studio in Hawaii. He was on set and uh, he did the voiceover for the first time. And he said, Bruce, what do you think of it? I said, it's great. He said, no, it's not. We got to do it again. And we did it again four or five times before he finally was satisfied with his own performance. So without further ado, we'll watch the film and then I'll tell you more about the Unitarian Universalist Office of the UN, so. Hi, I'm Andre Brower. Throughout the recorded history of life on Earth, freedom from the violence and destruction of war and the continuing search for human rights and social justice have eluded us. While the prophets long ago admonished us to beat our swords into plowshares, the dream of peace on earth and goodwill among all peoples has continued to challenge and often frustrate our best intentions and highest aspirations. And yet, in 1945, soon after World War II, the United Nations Conference on International Organization began in San Francisco. In addition to governments and what would later become member states, non-governmental organizations were invited to assist in the drafting of a charter. It was a heroic effort. And on October 24th, 1945, thanks in large part to the leadership of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, 
that charter became a reality and the United Nations was officially formed. 50 years ago, inspired by the United Nations and its ambitious charter, Adlai Stevenson II, a Unitarian Universalist who had recently been named ambassador to the United Nations by President John F. Kennedy, contacted Unitarian Universalist President Dana Greeley to urge the establishment of a volunteer envoy system to communicate the values of liberal religion on a global stage. Greeley immediately saw the wisdom of adding our voices to those of other faith traditions, and as a result, the UUA General Assembly adopted its first general resolution on the United Nations. Stevenson urged that the UUA establish an active presence for UUs within New York's international community, and the rest, as they say, is history. From the beginning, the United Nations Charter read like a Unitarian Universalist wish list, saving succeeding generations from the scourge of war, faith in human rights, equal rights for men, women, and children, justice and freedom, all are present in the Charter. It just made sense that a relatively small denomination like ours should seize the opportunity to make our voices heard in what most of us think of as the last best hope for living together with tolerance, protecting our planet, and maintaining peace and security for all people. It's never easy, but the alternatives are just not acceptable. We needed to be present. We needed to be heard. Apart from the Roosevelts, Adlai Stevenson and Dana Greeley, I credit Reverend Homer Jack and Elizabeth Swayze, who worked together to coordinate our advocacy with the U.S. government in Washington, D.C., and at the United Nations here in New York. We were first located at Community Church in Manhattan, and later at the U.N. Church Center on U.N. Plaza, where we continue to operate today. The UUA Office of Social Responsibility used these offices to promote world peace, human rights, disarmament, health and social issues on very meager budgets. We continue to do more with less, to speak out on the tough issues like HIV AIDS, the rights of women, sexual orientation and gender identity human rights, freedom of choice, reproductive health, and hunger and climate change. We speak truth to power and ways to get them to listen. Even though the United Nations is headquartered in New York City, it is a truly international body, as is our UUNO. Over the past 50 years, Canadian Unitarian Universalists have played key roles in the establishment and in some of the most significant achievements of our United Nations office. We were among the first representatives to the UN Economic and Social Council. We were privileged to be in Rome to help pull together the provisions of the Rome Statute regarding the protection of women. And we are especially honored to take part in the faith-based caucus led by Elaine Harvey that brought about the International Criminal Court which prosecutes the most heinous crimes against humanity. Canadians have played a pivotal and outsized role in the United Nations office and we are particularly proud for all that we have done and all that we have done together. But in 1969, Severe budget problems caused the UUA to have to curtail support for its UN office. The needs had not changed, but without the funds to keep the office open and to pay for a minimal staff and volunteer support, the future looked bleak indeed. Reverend Walter Donald Kring, senior minister of the Unitarian Church of All Souls in New York City, dreaded the thought of losing our presence and our voice in the church center and within the United Nations community itself. He eventually realized that if the office was to be saved, it would need to be reorganized as a separate but affiliated not-for-profit organization. It was time to raise funds and rally a volunteer cadre of support. The Unitarian Universalist United Nations office was about to re-emerge as a small but effective not-for-profit organization with its own board of directors and its own growing pains. Walter was adamant that the, there should be a Unitarian presence at the United Nations and that the office that was maintained there should remain open. Now, I think it's important to understand where his motivation came from. He was a chaplain in World War II. 
He served on an, air, on an uh, aircraft carrier in the South Pacific. He saw planes shot down. He saw young men die. And peace was very important to him. In addition to that, he was well versed in international cultures, religions, arts, and he, uh, the, as the stained glass behind me indicates, he was very conscious of interreligious necessity. And his artwork always reflected with the greatest respect the culture of various nations and peoples. So he went to work, he organized, he petitioned, he probably raised a little money, and with the help of a man named Homer Jack, he and Mr. Jack, Reverend Jack, enabled this office to continue. It was important to Walter, he did everything he could, he did it well, and he did it. Working under severe economic hardship, the office managed to advance its mission in the international community. Hosting annual seminars for Unitarian Universalist youth and adults, speaking out through newsletters, conferences, and an impressive internship program, the United Nations office built a reputation for leadership on issues that others were reluctant to take on. We played a key role in the establishment of the Millennium Development Goals, which were adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2005. I was hired as executive director in 2008 after serving as a U.S. diplomat with the Department of State for 25 years throughout the world. My UUUNO position allowed me to speak out on issues that needed to be addressed. We have a wonderful UN Millennium Development Demonstration Project in Ghana called Every Child is Our Child, a program to support AIDS orphans with health care and education in coordination with the Maya Krobo Queen Mothers Association. And we took a strong stand to support Reverend Mark Kiemba in his opposition to the Ugandan Kill the Gays Bill. We succeeded against all odds to get sexual orientation and gender identity human rights onto the agenda of the UN NGO Human Rights Conference in Paris to commemorate the 60th anniversary of the signing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and that was in 2008. Due to our continuing efforts, the UN has gone from apathy on this subject to putting in place personnel, policies, and programs in all of its agencies and becoming a global advocate with regular speeches from the UN Secretary General and the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, promoting equal rights regardless of sexual orientation and gender identity. The UUUNO's phenomenal success in this area has catapulted it into leadership roles in support of the International Criminal Court, disarmament, peace and security, sustainable development, climate change issues, and all aspects of human rights, including migrant rights, indigenous people's rights, women's rights, and more. This is what your office has done and can continue to do with your support. As chair of the United Nations Office Advisory Board, I had the unique experience of traveling to Ghana with my wife Mary and with UUA leadership to observe the Every Child is Our Child program firsthand. It was a moving experience. To witness the life-saving care and educational support provided by the Queen Mothers Association was truly amazing. While we were there, we met with public health and education officials and with the leaders of UNICEF in Ghana. They all told us the same thing. The Every Child program is a model of sustainable compassion and a true best practice. Mary and I have never been more proud of what our denomination has accomplished and is accomplishing every day in Ghana. This is exactly what the United Nations had envisioned for the Millennium Development Goals. And our United Nations office is leading the way. In recognition of the UN office's leadership, Knotts was named chair of the United Nations NGO Committee on Human Rights. And in 2012, its 50th anniversary, the UUA Board of Directors, the Canadian Unitarian Council, and the UNO Board of Directors all voted unanimously 
to merge the United Nations office back to its home within the UUA. After 50 years of advocacy and service, our UN office homecoming was the best anniversary gift that any of us could imagine. It just didn't make sense to have our international voice in New York as a separate organization. The time was right for all of us to recognize the signal contributions being made on our behalf on the world stage. I think we all saw a continuing need for global witness in a world torn by strife, riddled by inequality, and calling all of us to speak out for peace and social justice. I think we can all be proud of what we've accomplished, but our United Nations office continues to need both financial and volunteer support if we're not merely going to survive, but prevail. Even though now it's a part, an integral part of the UUA, our United Nations office continues to need the direct support of UUs everywhere. Gifts designated for our United Nations office will be put to work to amplify our voices and protect the issues that all of us care about. It's a great investment in world peace, human rights, and social justice. So it's a truly happy and hopeful 50th anniversary. But let it also be a renewal of our commitment to the dream of world peace and to our best hopes for a better life for all. Even though we may be few in numbers, we've proven that the courage of our convictions the passion we share for our issues and the compassion we have for the plight of others can make a difference, a world of difference in a world that needs us now more than ever. I think you're muted, Bruce. Sorry. Hope you enjoyed the film. We certainly enjoyed making it. And I'm going to kind of go through the history, some of which you've already seen in the film, but I'll try not to be repetitive. I do want to mention uh, Elaine Harvey, who was uh, highlighted in the film, also John Washburn, uh, who was a member of Community Church. So it was both John Washburn, a member of Community Church here in New York, and Elaine Harvey was a member of the church in Kingston, Ontario, that led the faith-based caucus for the establishment of the International Criminal Court. And you probably have read recently, the International Criminal Court has just filed an indictment against Vladimir Putin for crimes against humanity and war crimes. Um, it is amazing for a small organization like we were, uh, that we were able to accomplish really huge events. The International Criminal Court is no small uh, piece of work. We also put together what we call the Compass for Compassion. And we put together 100 faith-based voices that said it was time to end discrimination and violence based on sexual orientation and gender identity. And I worked together with Canon Albert Ogo from the Episcopal Church and we got this passed through the uh, United Nations, and we really mainstreamed uh, sexual orientation and gender identity human rights at the UN. In 2015, I got a call from the attorneys of Tamir Rice. And you may remember that Tamir Rice um, was a 12-year-old boy who was killed by the police in Cleveland, Ohio. He was just doing, he was, have, playing in a park and he was just killed. And so the family called me and said, can you do something to highlight this at the United Nations? And I said, yes. And um, then another attorney called and said that he knew Harry mm -hmm. Belafonte. And I said, if you know Harry Belafonte, we're gonna have a much bigger event than I had originally envisaged. So we had an event at one of the largest rooms at the, um, at the UN, uh, the, t the trusteeship council, we had 500 people in the audience. The event was live webcast around the world. We had the High Commissioner for Human Rights. We had Harry Belafonte. We had uh, the family of Tamir Rice. We also had 
Alicia Garza from Black Lives Matter, the head of Amnesty International. It was just a huge event, and we kicked off the UN Decade of People of African Descent. And we highlighted that and said that we wanted to end the silence uh, about structural racism. So this was, again, a huge event that our office was able to, uh, to put together at the UN. So not only sexual orientation, gender identity, human rights, not only the International Criminal Court, but we kicked off the decade of people of African descent. Uh, then I was the executive director of the, or actually the chair of the NGO DPI executive committee at the United Nations. And that was a committee that represents 2000 uh, NGOs at the United Nations. And I didn't realize it, but I was quite an important person by virtue of that station. And I got invited to a lot of places to, to talk. And I got invited to the World League of Freedom and Democracy in Taiwan. And I went there several times. And I could tell that Taiwan was ready to adopt sexual orientation, gender identity, was it ready to adopt same-sex marriage. And so I really pushed it. I talked to the vice president. I talked to the former president. I talked to the foreign minister. I talked to members of both political parties. I talked to activists. And over and over again, I just kept pushing this idea. And it actually was the Presbyterians in Taiwan, and they organized a referendum. And uh, the referendum voted on the idea of having same-sex marriage, and the majority of the people in Taiwan voted against same-sex marriage. And I gave a speech, and I said, you can't vote against people's human rights. The majority will always vote against the minor minority. And it's unfair, and it's not right to, to vote against somebody's human rights. And that speech was uh, quoted in the uh, General Assembly and the uh, uh, at, at the uh, the legislature of Taiwan, and they wound up passing same-sex marriage, and they quoted me over and over again in the debate on that. And Taiwan is the only country in Asia, huge continent of Asia, biggest continent in, in the world. It's the only country that has adopted same-sex marriage. And we played a role in that. You saw the, uh, the Every Child is Our Child project. This is a wonderful project uh, with the Maya Krobo Queen Mothers. We were highlighted by the government of Ghana and saying this is the best partnership between a nonprofit agency and indigenous women. And we were actually able to work very closely with indigenous women to make that project a success. We had about 120 children a year went uh, through our system and were able to get an education through the help uh, of our project with the Queen Mothers. And it really was a, a magnificent project. You saw the children, you heard people speak of the, um, uh, of the project. Uh, from that, then we had this new administration, the administration we have now at the UUA, and things started going downhill. The first thing that was taken away from us was the Every Child is Our Child project. The, um, the supervisor that I had said that all uh, international charities are bad, and this is a charity project, and we shouldn't do it. And so she canceled the Every Child is Our Child project. The other thing you, you heard that we were first at community church, and then we wound up at the church center. You saw the church center building where we had our office. That office was terminated in 2021. And so we no longer had this office um, at the church center. And having an office at the church center, it's right across uh, First Avenue from the United Nations. It was the ideal place to network, to meet UN delegates, to really have a, uh, a say at the UN. And um, so that's, that was a, a tragedy. 
And it got to the point where I, I would, our internship program was cut and I just thought, okay, it's time for me to leave because everything is being cut. They cut the uh, Every Child is Our Child project. They got rid of our office. They you know, curtailed the internship program. And I decided that I needed to retire. I needed to leave because there really wasn't much left for me to do. And the one thing that really concerned me was the welfare of the two interns that I had from New York University. And I'm actually adjunct professor at New York University. And one of my interns uh, is now in my class. And I talked to her and I said, when I left, when I left the office, what happened to you? What, what happened? What did they do? And I, Carrie McDonald, who's the executive vice president of the UUA, promised me that these interns would be well taken care of that they would have a good internship at the United Nations. And I said, okay, I'll take you at your word. I hope that's true. So when I asked my uh, student who was my intern, I said, what happened? She said, nothing happened. We were ignored, we were neglected. And finally, the New York University took us out of the UUA program and gave us an internship with Catholic Charities because the UUA was not uh, helping our interns. And I'm not at all happy about that. And you've seen that we had a, an illustrious history at the United Nations for 60 years. We accomplished amazing things and it's gone. There is no uh, UUA person at the United Nations. There's nobody representing the Canadian Unitarian Council. Uh, I continue to stay at the UN, but I don't represent the UUA. I don't represent the CUC as I used to. I do represent the International Convocation of Unitarian Universalist Women. And I'm still on the NGO Committee on Human Rights. I still chair the NGO Committee on Disarmament, Peace and Security. I had a meeting today with the Swiss Mission to the UN as part of the NGO Working Group on the Security Council. Uh, Switzerland will be the president of the Security Council for the month of May, taking over from the Russians. Um, so it's sad that this office that had done such amazing work for 60 years uh, really doesn't exist any longer. Um, the UUA is, is trying to work with UUSC, the service committee, and have some kind of uh, presence at the United Nations. The UU Service Committee has UN status, and they do amazing work, but they use their UN status to make sure that their partners have access to have a platform at the United Nations. They do not do what we did for 60 years. What we did for 60 years was affect policy change at the United Nations using UU values. And that is not what UUSC is doing. So what is the future? Uh, I'm already in discussions with the NAUA. I, uh, uh, they are willing and, and desirous of having a UN presence. And that is definitely possible. And I will be working with NAUA to make sure that it has a presence at the United Nations and I will be very happy to work uh, with NAUA because I think um, what we were able to accomplish at the UN for 60 years with the International Criminal Court, with LGBT rights, with the decade of people of African descent, with the Every Child is Our Child project, this comes from our values, the values of being Unitarian Universalists. And those values are important to the UN. And many people at the UN say this. They said well, that, that, that we added something to the UN that nobody else had. And so it's important that we continue to have a voice at the UN. And if we can't do that with the UUA, we can do it with NAUA. And that's pretty much what I have to say today. Hi, and thank, thanks, Bruce. Uh, I really enjoyed that talk and found it both informative and, and inspiring. I mean, I think it's easy these days to 
talk and feel about all that we seem to have lost in our liberal religion. But I, I think that, uh, especially at the end, I got inspired to think of what we can do to to encourage the, you know encourage and support Unitarians from making a difference in the wider world. Uh, for those who are watching just this recording, uh, I'd let you know that we had an interesting question and answer session after uh, after Bruce's presentation with Bruce, and then we broke up into uh, breakout rooms and uh, got a chance to uh, to meet each other uh, in a more informal way. So I hope that uh, you're able to join us uh, an, uh, another another time, either on Zoom live or by watching these recordings. Uh, the list of upcoming courses is available on the NAU website, NA Unitarians website, that's naunitarians.org, uh, under the uh, uh, NAU Academy. Uh, you can also uh, subscribe to the, uh, to the newsletter where upcoming announcements will be posted, or, uh, and we hope that you'll feel like you want to join uh, the North, North American Unitarian Association. So thank you all and good night.